Monday of every month. Um, why Mondays? Because we modeled ourselves after Mobile Mondays. Um, we're not officially affiliated with them or anything. That's another story for another day. Um, our website is mobileportland.com, and we've also got, I believe actually we have two Google Groups you can sign up for, um, but you can go to our website to get information. Um, we'll give you announcements about coming meetings, and we also have a list um, for job announcements and things like that. Um, we've got some upcoming events. Uh, I think three of these are Mobile Portland, so I'll group those together. Uh, tonight, Mobile Portland. Um, we've got the Couch Comp coming up. That's in Portland here on March 14th. Um, Mobile Portland in March is on the 26th, and then April is on the 23rd. April 16th through the 18th is the Breaking Dev Conference in Orlando, Florida, and that is a really awesome mobile conference. Um, I went to the one, I think it was September, and it's truly fantastic. Smart people, great topics. And then um, Mobilism, if you're lucky enough to go to Amsterdam, in May 10th and 11th. Uh, quick thanks to our sponsors. Uh, Urban Airship providing this wonderful space and all the support to make sure all this stuff shows up so we can have this meeting. Um, and Cloudflare, which is the company I work for. By the way, I am Megan from Cloudflare. Should have introduced myself already. Um, we're going to take a moment here to do job openings. So if you have any announcements to make or any jobs that are open, we'll pass the mic around and we'll take maybe five minutes or so to go through those. Anybody? All right. My name is Jason, I'm with uh, Slalom Consulting, and we're looking for mobile developers and some mobile project managers. So afterwards, uh, if you're interested, stop by and I'll hang around and find me. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Mark. Um, this isn't actually a job announcement. Uh, I'm uh, working for a large company in the local area. Uh, we're going to have a contest, and the contest is around applications where people can take control of their own personal data and potentially sell it back to all the people that we're currently giving it free to. <laughs> so if, if you're interested, that sounds kind of intriguing, uh, I'll be standing over here afterwards. Hi, I'm Will Lee Sierra, I'm here with uh, Azad Consulting. We've been in the area for about 20 years. We're also looking for iOS, Android developers, in addition to that, Java developers, employee insurance analysts. I'll be here afterwards if anyone wants to uh, talk to me about what is on your offer. Hey, I'm Clifton. I'm with Revisit. We've been in the area for about 20 weeks. Um, <laughs> that's coming again. Um, we're hiring designers right now. We're not exactly a mobile company, but we are trying to be as mobile friendly as possible. Uh, it's an app for uh, letting design teams communicate around their designs. So uh, we're at Pi. We're awesome. We're trying to hire them right now. So. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Rodolph. I'm uh, from Amazon. Actually, we're responsible for what we're going to be talking about. We're certainly uh, looking for interested parties that are want to help uh, drive the direction of textbooks and uh, you know, education forward. I'm talking to answers. Anyone else? How many people is the first mobile form that you've been to? Awesome. But I think we've got a lot, actually. That's great. Welcome. Um, so we are talking about iBooks 2.0 tonight. Um, we're going to have kind of two sections for this presentation. Corey Pressman, who is the founder of Extrema Media, is going to come first and give a little presentation. Um, he actually was with us back in August of 2010 where we talked about um, mobile technology and education. So he's here to kind of give his perspective on what iBooks 2.0 and iBooks Author and iTunes U means for students, teachers, and textbook publishers. Um, he used to be a teacher, taught anthropology, I believe, for 12 years. Um, and now he started Experiment Media, a software company dedicated to creating robust and engaging educational experiences for web and both native. Um, after that, after he's done it, he's hilarious and fun, so I'm super excited to hear this. He promised me, he also promised me that he was going to sing, so just be warned. <laughs> um, after that, we're going to have a panel come up, um, and uh, Thor Pritchard is going to be moderating that. He's the CEO of Clarity Innovations. 
Um, well, he'll be joined by Steve Burt, um, who is a manager of content and research for Clarity Innovations, and Tim Lauer, who's principal at um, Lewis Elementary School. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Are you ready? Are you ready to sing? <laughs> <laughs> My agent said I can't sing without different Oh, man. <laughs> well, it's going to be holding a microphone. It's very dumb. Is this working? Hello. Hello. Uh, is this, can you hear me now? Very good. All right. Let's get this set away. So yeah, I am Corey Pressman, and I started Extrema Media in 2006 after teaching college for, for 12 years, uh, community college. It's a lot of repeating yourself. So I wanted to stay in education, but not repeat myself. But now I just repeat myself, and I'm in media. Um, so Extrema Media focuses on educational um, software, and um, that winds up being a, a lot of the time for textbook publishers. Those are our biggest clients, and I still believe in them as clients because they have so much juicy content, um, and they are sort of ground zero for delivering this content in an educational context, at least for now. And I think there might be some changes afoot, but those are slower maybe than I'd like them to be. Uh, with that being said, we wind up making educational media for a variety of clients. <coughs> when we started out, we were making stuff for CD-ROMs. Remember those? And I still have them. unique gold standard CD-ROMs. I've got a closet full of them, just lying around. Um, but as things changed and moved over to web, we became more consultants to our clients. And they were as confused as anyone else. So what do we do now? Um, and now that it's mobile, everyone's completely terrified and confused. So we're able to be terrified and confused with them and kind of partner with these Content providers is really what publishers are, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, to, um, to partner with them and try to figure out what the next steps are. But really, when it comes to talking about textbooks, it's really talking about publishing. At least for now, it's publishing, it's a publishing game. It's about publishing. You can't talk about textbooks without talking about publishing. How do you know? I don't even need to be here. It's a waste of time. But um, the news is good, it's not bleak. It's not as bleak as, I just got back from the Tools of Change conference, the O'Reilly Tools of Change conference, where I gave a talk similar to this. And I gave a talk similar to this at Books and Browsers and at a Tools of Change conference um, that was here in Portland. And there's always this thing in the air, publishing conferences, this sort of, oh my god, it's over, kind of feeling. And everyone's just scrambling for, for saving themselves. It's like dinosaurs watching the comet and they're just, you can see it reflected in their eyes. And so, it's just terrible. Because um, everyone's scrambling for how do we get everything <coughs> designed into EPUB, and that's all they're thinking about. And that's a lot of what my talk is a reaction to. Um, unless that's really what you're into, I'm sorry. So people, that's all you want to do. I'm sorry, it's over. So, it's not, however, it's not such a terrible story in that there, there's this, what's this? It's a timeline, that's right. I really don't need to be here. So we got, wait, so we have the inception of the species of Homo sapiens and the end of civilization, and there's this thing in the middle of it all called publishing. <laughs> and publishing is a very long thing. It started not at the inception of the species, but just after. It ends with the end of civilization, because publishing is the linchpin of civilization. <laughs> I threw that in for when it was publishing conferences. <laughs> now there is three beer. <laughs> However, you see what I mean? Like, do you see what I mean by this? Publishing is going to be around for a long time. It really just started. This is kind of where we are now, right at the beginning of publishing. So it's going to be around for a long time. If you define publishing as, you know, content providers curating content and wrapping it up in consumable forms for folks. How's that? Good. Textbook definition. Get it? Yes. <laughs> However, there's obviously something going on in publishing. This is all true for all of publishing, and I think especially true for textbook publishing, because textbooks are unique from, let's say, like a Pulp Fiction title, yeah? Yeah. Right? I mean, they're all the pedagogical content. They're sort of already interactive in a way. They always have unique layouts. The editions change every three months. That doesn't happen to your romance novel. It should, though. It doesn't matter. So, this is kind of the moment that we are at right now in publishing. It's a situation like this. And by the way, the name of this talk, when I give it to publishers, is Hopeful Monsters. And this kind of explains it. Is anyone familiar with that phrase? Me either. I'll come up with what it is soon. 
This it describes the hopeful monsters are. This is um, this is evolution. This is the bottom line as a species grooving through time. It's just what's it doing? It's just it's just grooving through time, man. It's stable. It's not changing. It's doing its thing. It matches the environment. It's in equilibrium. Yeah, and yeah. And then something happens to break the equilibrium, to disrupt the equilibrium. And then a new collection of creatures emerges that then vie for also becoming species in equilibrium. Making sense so far? That, and when that happens, and there's lots of examples of this happening in biology, but I'm using this as a simile. So I won't go into the biological things, but I'll show you what I mean in publishing. So right now we're sort of at, there's been this disruption event. And now there's all these new variations vying for being stable species. Those new variations in biology are referred to as hopeful monsters. Yeah, dig? Yeah? yeah it, kind of, it kind of relates to publishing in a way. So there are three important events. There's a species that's just doing what? It's just doing what? Species is just doing what? And then there's a disruption, and that it pops out, and you've got yourself some new variations. You've got yourself the hopeful. Both of you, right? The hopeful monsters that are then eventually going to become something stable in the future. Where are we now in this whole thing? Yeah, we're, we're grooving, just disrupted, right? What's this going to be? Ask me. Say, what's that going to be? No clue. No, I have no way to know. But Extrema's going to make it. <laughs> Whatever it is. And by the way, if you're a talented project manager or interaction designer, you want to make it with you, let me know. <laughs> you don't need money or sworn money. I'll pay you in sandwiches. So there's the thing that's grooving, which is just the book. It's just the book. It's the book. It's been the book since 1550. Make that up. You get the idea. It's been the book for, it's been the book for quite a long time. Actually, it's about this. So it's been the book for a long time. There was a disruption event, and what was the disruption event? Yeah. The internet, that's the invention of the World Wide Web Browser, 1990. Pretty amazing stuff happened. <coughs> what happened then? Disruption. Pretty amazing stuff, that's right. Disruption happened then. That's when, like, you go to these publishing conferences and the catchphrase at the Tools of Change conference was the crisis of abundance. We have so much content, it's a crisis of abundance. We don't have any more content than we used to have. And publishers in 18 in 1980 were like, we have a crisis of abundance of words, sentences. What do we do with all these pages? There was no crisis, but there's a crisis. There's a crisis of abundance now because content is now differentiated from its container. Yeah, right. So the container used to be like the same thing as the content was all there as a book, but now that it's separated, and that's what happened at that moment. That's when millions of people got geek chills and didn't know why. One day in May, 1990, something just happened. There's a crisis of abundance. And ever since then, we've had this event where now we have all the hopeful monsters. And what are the hopeful monsters that have arisen? Plus, it's almost boring now, all these hopeful monsters. They're out there, they're vying for being the next platform. We have all of these ways of delivering content. We've got devices, we've got platforms on devices, we've got multiple platforms on single devices, it's a total hairy mess. But it's a mess that started a long time ago. But I think it's something we can trace through. What is this? I had to use my old slides for teaching anthropology. Why? <laughs> this is right, it's cave art, and this is the beginning of getting, you know, getting um, content. What is content ultimately? Ideas, right? It's just, it's just neurological connections. Getting them out there into a container started back then in the Upper Paleolithic, getting content on the containers. And the cave walls, a lot like the book, in that the content and the container are married. They're there. They're together. Interestingly, mobile content started around the same time. <laughs> it's true! This is a little piece of bone with a moon chart on it. You could groove around with it, and you could do this every 15 minutes, wait. <laughs> I'm driving, pay attention. So, <laughs> so, you have all this mobile stuff, you got all that stuff going on, but even in the mobile context, what's the relationship between content and container? Yeah, they're married, they're the same, they're wet, they're there, there's no crisis of abundance yet. And then, just to rapidly jump into the future and in a different 
the hemisphere altogether, you have the scribal era of books when they, uh, they're actually being handmade, they're drawn, they're beautiful. That was very stable. Yeah? It was in equilibrium. It was in equilibrium. And then there was a disruption event of the printing press and that kind of stuff going on. But interestingly, when the printing press, this is paying very close attention. <laughs> I know you're drifting. It's like, what's this history lesson nonsense? Well, I'm talking about you. <laughs> so, when you start looking at the first books that were being made with printing presses, what did they look like? Handwritten scribed books. They were just like the old things. In other words, they hadn't invented, they hadn't started applying user interface protocol specific to the new platform. <laughs> right? They were using old UX paradigms on a new platform. Page curl, anyone? <laughs> right? Let's say right or something. So I'm not right. Okay, right. Groovy. And so they kind of just looked like that. And it lasted for a long time. Hundreds of years people put up with this. Why was it happening? The users were stupid. The users were stupid. That's why. We're <laughs> done now. We're smart now. But it has something to do with that. The users were expecting that kind of thing. The people generating, for the, the people designing for the platform weren't thinking progressively. It took time, but eventually it started to morph into things we recognize as books. It really took like three or four hundred years. Eventually you get things that start to look bookish. Here's a table of contents. An amazing thing was it when it was invented. Wayfinding on the new platform. The other platform didn't have wayfinding. It was kind of had all this time. And so now, you got this, I love how it says the con tense. They don't have the whole wrapping thing, the flow. It hasn't been worked out yet. This one's got a picture with text wrapping around it, where it doesn't have spaces between words, but we'll deal with that later. It's got paragraphs. So it's evolving slowly and becoming. These are hopeful monsters, yeah? And this period of time was referred to as, these, these devices here are called incanabula. Say it, please. <laughs> in Canabula, which is Latin for cradle. There were cradles, there were little babies. They simple little things rising from the ooze, hoping to become books someday. And the Incanabula period, filled with Incanabula. <laughs> Realize that stuff, do you? Come on, this machine doesn't like it, I get snarky. <laughs> Maybe it's this connection. I'll mind the slides if I have to. Don't go far. So, eventually you get this. This is a 16th century artifact. And what is it, clearly? It's a book, but it took so long to get interaction design protocols for the new platform. And now we're sort of in a very similar period where you've got you've got all these what are what's really going on here? They're in cannabulum in their own way. They're hopeful monsters, but there's not there's, there's not this or it's, it's it's not what it is. It's not one thing, but it is another. What it's not is satisfying. What it's not is progressively designed. What it's not is future. What it is is in cannabulum. It's pasty. It's not platform specific yet. Maybe it never will be. Maybe it should be, maybe it shouldn't be. But one thing we need to realize, especially in the textbook era, this is so specific to textbooks, it doesn't necessarily apply to like the Pulp Fiction novel, etc. Although maybe it does. There are people doing some amazing things. But ultimately, this is not a book. This thing. Yeah? yeah. Calling it a book is just like calling those books scrolls. And we don't need to have any cannabula period, do we? No, we don't. No, we say, no, get them out of here. Where are the villagers? Big horse. No beer for you. No, we shouldn't have to have one. We have interaction design professionals. There were no interaction design professionals in 1250. Like, oh, I got a UX degree. Didn't happen. It wasn't happening. But now you've got people with UX design degrees. We can do this, yeah? And they're in the digital space already. So we can design the future. We'll get back to that in a second. Once you start thinking about these things, you turn to French scholarship. And this is an amazing book called The Order of Books, written by Roger Chartier. And it was written in like 1990. And what's brilliant about it is that in 1990, he had chapters like 
a library without walls, communities of readers. It's really inspiring. And he says some pretty heavy stuff in here, man. Like, whatever they may do, authors do not write books. Books are not written at all. They are manufactured by scribes and artisans, by mechanics and other engineers, and by printing presses and other machines. So what's the semantic thing he's doing? What's he saying? What are books? Yeah, the map is not the territory. Right? Book is not the content. The content is something that's out. It's neurological pathways. Put it on a cave wall, but let's not call them people. We don't go around with books saying, can I borrow that cave wall from you? Right? They're not cave walls anymore. They're not books anymore if you're going to put it on the iPad, for example. Therefore, there is no comprehension of any written piece that does not at least in part depend upon the forms in which it reaches the reader. The artifact matters, and it matters a lot, especially when you've got this crisis of abundance and you're getting textbook content and putting it on an iPad. If you just take the PDF and put it on the iPad, what are you doing? Sucking. Yeah, sucking, yes. <laughs> you can hear it every time you open a course smart book, you can hear the sucking sound. What is that sound? That's the sound of a PDF being served up to you. Right? And then, oh, I know, let's make the pictures clickable. And then it gets bigger. What's that sound? Is that right there? That's good. You got your pocket. And I didn't say that. So, ultimately, content does not equal the experience, and the text itself doesn't equal the object. And if we can get this into and get publishers thinking about this. And especially, again, does this really apply to a romance novel? Maybe not so much. I can't, I can't wrap my head around that per se. But when you get, start getting into the unique context of pedagogical content, educational content, textbooks, they can be, they've always been trying to be so much more. Yeah? yeah. Right? And now they can be so much more for a really long time. Um, the space between the content and the experience is where the meaning is constructed. That's where the thing becomes what it is. So we are not, I don't like the word ebook per se, especially when it comes to textbooks. E textbook, that bugs me out. I prefer to think of them as post book artifacts. Post book sucks just as bad as ebook, but I just like it better. <laughs> One. And two, I think it's more descriptive. It's post book. It's not, an ebook means, I don't know, it's like calling paper books cave wall things. A wall thing, or just when you call them people versus e books. I hate that. I don't, do you hate that too? Let's hate that. Yes, yeah. yeah, hate that. Yes. Where's that sound? Yes. Yeah, so when I say closed book, especially at the publishing conferences, people start standing up and leaving and spit balls. I don't mean closed book and that we're replacing the old book. That's not what I'm talking about. What happened? What happened? Yeah, this <coughs> punctuated equilibrium, we call it in biology today. There's, where's the book, the paper book in the future? It's right there, it's fine. Maybe it's not, but I think it's fine, it's there. <laughs> Again, publishing audiences like to hear that. It's fine, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> fine. It's fine, when I say post book, I don't mean let's burn all the books and just have post books or e-books or whatever. Ludicrous, not interested in that. However, we can have a coexistence especially in the textbook market, yeah? Especially in the textbook, let's say it again. Especially, especially in the textbook market, that's right. Where we don't necessarily, that maybe we don't need. <laughs> so when we're talking about post books, we're talking about something in particular. What, someone asked me what a post book is. What's a post book? We got text. I don't know how we're still doing it. <laughs> Existential moment. <laughs> Which? Fine so far. What was I saying? So, oh, what is a post book? So, I, I don't know. I think a post book is something like this. When you were, can you read that? When you were very. Oh, experience. All the various security content. Nice. But that's really dense. I don't know. I don't know. Experiencing multifarious curated content in intentionally designed context is exactly where the textbook market. I don't call it market. That's a wiki. Not a business. Whatever. Not that. Um, it's where that thing needs to go. It, so uh, let's unpack this. I, I made it dense on purpose. I'm an academic, so I can't help it. But I, I think I think it's concise. I think that's why I did. When I say multifarious content, what do I mean? Now, before I go any further, there's something here. Liza Daly is this genius who thinks about publishing. She's a, um, 
and she's in the publishing world on the software side. And she has this thing that I call the daily rule that she wrote um, in the, uh, the it's called book, a Futurist Manifesto. And in her one of her essays in there, she writes that if you're going to make like enhanced ebooks, she calls them, which kills me. It can not be like a freaky sounding. But if you're making these things, be sure when you add stuff that it's immersive and non-trivial. Don't just start throwing things in there. Yeah? Like your core smart book where if you click on the picture, it moves sideways. Okay, great. Okay, <coughs> right? But that's not that's not non it's not it's trivial. Also be sure that the stuff you put in there is well immersed in there. In other words, when you're designing these things, who should you hire? You. That's, that's right. <laughs> you should hire me. Or any UX professional. Are there UX professionals? Yes. Yeah, I wish more were working for me. But yes, there are. And so publishers need to get involved with this. Like, oh, let's make our textbook a book. Charlie, what should we do? Make the pictures bigger. Yes. No, let's go out and partner with interaction designers. Get involved. So what kind of, what do I mean by multifarious content? What kind of content is there that can be added? And by the way, when you start adding content, what do you do? What should it be? It should be immersive, immersive and non-trivial. Non I'm just talking about throwing stuff in there. But we can have publisher-provided content. I have it right here. It could be copy, it could be interactive things, it could be videos, it could be audio, all of that stuff that publishers already have, and that's why I'm still interested in working with them. <coughs> However, with iBook Author, there's something very interesting there. Who could be the content provider now? Y'all. Now, you could have done it before, but what would you have to do? Own a software company, right? Marry uh, an engineer, which I would never recommend. So, <laughs> what would you do? What would you do? There's nothing you can do, but now with iBook Author, it's amazing that now you can actually wind up making post books yourself, which is kind of cool. I think that's what's revolutionary about it, if it worked. It's free, so I can't expect it all to work. We'll talk about that later. Maybe. So, publisher provider content is copy, interactives, video, audio, and now we have the opportunity to integrate all kinds of other content. Again, this is super, I think, important for the textbook universe. Not so much for the romance novel universe, maybe, but I think that's maybe more trivial. I think it's super non-trivial when you start adding this to an educational platform. Notation and commentary, highlighting and marking, bookmarking, reading activity. What do I mean by reading activity? How is that content? Yeah? Because you're going back to it. And yet, and if you're going back to the same place over and over again, maybe the machine knows what you're reading, right? Serves up the things you want. When I was at the conference, that Tools of Change conference, the cookbook people there, and I see cookbooks as textbooks. They're really the same kind of thing. It's pedagogical, rich content. Man, they were talking about how you could tell your cookbook, I'm a vegetarian who hates... Let's say, I can't think of a vegetable to hate. But, Brussels sprouts. So now the cookbook, when it serves up recipes to you, won't give you Brussels sprouts and pork. Right? That's, it kind of becomes content in its own right. Social annotation. In other words, sharing annotations. And there's not nearly enough going on with sharing annotation. There's some flirtation with it, but no one's really focusing enough yet on this, I think, essential aspect to creating a community of learners through a postbook experience. Yeah? That felt good to say. That wasn't rather than... People sharing notes through an ebook. That's like, okay, I don't know, is it a book? You share your notes? No, it's a post book experience in which shared annotations can occur. How cool would it be to have someone like Stephen Hawking have annotations inside your book? Or your, your post book about this. You wouldn't like that? You would. You should be You don't like Stephen Hawking? <laughs> right, listen, you're with me, I'm sorry. Um, social activity, all of these things can be tied into a post book. And then I'm talking about curated content. Maintaining and adding value to a trusted body of digital information for the current and future use from the Digital Curation Center. Do you see what I'm getting at? It's not just throwing your content in there. It's not just taking everything about chemistry and putting it out into some kind of colorful ebook, but curating it, massaging it, and more importantly, where's, where's the thing? Oh, what's that? Adding, adding value to it by doing these things I'm talking about. This is a quote from. Um, oh, it's not this is a quote from Brian O'Leary, another thinker on the future of publishing. The challenges publishers face is not just being digital, because that's getting easier. It's being demonstrably relevant to the audiences who now turn first to digital to find content. 
We must create agile, discoverable, and accessible content. It's got to be hot. And how can we make it hot? UX designers. Right. That's a good hire hot UX designers only. <laughs> I've never met one who wasn't, though. So, because I'm, I'm all about mine. So, interaction design is what you've got to hire. There's not enough of this going on either. You make it up. There's so much of just get the PDF interactive. Get the PDF interactive. What's the mantra of the publishing world right now? Uh, it's primal monsters. But it's right. It's hopeful monsters. Get the PDF interactive. That's all they're doing. And I think we can do a lot more if we loosen it up. And that's some of what iBook Author is allowing us to do. It comes with a few templates right now. What I'm really excited about is the future of iBook Author, not the current free iBook Author with seven templates. I'll, actually, I'd like to pay, tell Apple, I'd like to pay like $800 for the robust one. Seven hundred. Four ninety nine. dollars I'll pay. Five hundred bucks. Three hundred dollars I pay for the iBook Author, where you can maybe do a little more design, a little more robusticity, but let, let, it, let it be as it is. Do you see why I'm excited about it? Yeah? It allows us to make both most books of our own. Um, and then, of course, it's making things for all of these contexts, for, for a variety of contexts, for all these different places it can show up, for all the hopeful monsters. Which one of these hopeful monsters will win and become the post book platform? The one Extremo makes. Nobody else. So really, what it comes down to in my vision is, is hopeful monsters like this one. The post-book era, especially when it comes to pedagogical content, has to be deep and wide. What is that? That's an octopus. What's it doing? It's cooking where? In my kitchen. Right? It's being cooked. I wanted to make octopus the other day. Because I love making octopus, I do not know how to make octopus. I do now. But it was hard, even in this in 2012, like 2012, we're deep into future now. Robots do all kinds of things, we're connected to devices. I want to make some, some... Octopus, right. I got hung up on Brussels. <laughs> I want to make an octopus, but I didn't know how. So I needed some educational content. But what did I have to do? I, I looked at all my textbooks, nothing was working there. I mean, my textbooks. I looked at my cookbooks, nothing really satisfying there on octopus. Bivens had to cook everything, I had octopus didn't look good to me. So, I went online, I watched several YouTube videos, you with me? I, I read some recipes online, I then, I live right by 28th, um, 28th Avenue up in the east side where Navarre is and Bamboo, two of the best restaurants in the galaxy. I went there, tried their octopus, spoke to the chefs there, how they make octopus. I went and watched more videos. I went to Chow Hound, into a chat room, and spoke to strangers about making octopus. This is exhausting. <laughs> Eventually, I made the octopus. It was awesome. It boils for a long time. Five hours. Bay water. <laughs> and some of them grilled also afterwards with a little like Spanish paprika. Best olive oil you can afford. But the point is, what I, I'm sorry, <laughs> vegetarians are not, not happy. You can also experience this through a filter. <laughs> so, what would have been cool, my vision is, so it's not a textbook per se, but my vision is, would have been to have a post book app, an app, a kind of app I'm talking about, this post book object, which we call Extrema Media, we call them armchair apps. That we would have an armchair app. Say armchair app. Make it real. <laughs> An armchair app where you can just sit back in your armchair and go deep and wide on any given topic. Be an armchair app about cooking, let's say, or cooking optimally for that matter, in which you can just skim over the surface and at any point dig down deep, go inside. An armchair app. I could have watched the videos in there. I could have gone and, and, and watched chefs being interviewed. I could have had chow hound type. Um, discussions with people. Go to take a class all inside this one armchair app. One place you can sit in your armchair and experience a topic deep and wide. So imagine an armchair app for chemistry. It's not a textbook anymore. And who could use the armchair app for chemistry? Anyone. So it could be for the general audience. It could also be for the uh, for the student. For example, it could come with, with uh, syllabi, with curriculum, for instructors to use that armchair app. 
it could all, it could be wide, and you could just groove on it just to have in your house like an encyclopedia, but it can also go deep at any moment and take you in. This is a post-book object. It's not a book. It's not, the stress isn't, how do we get this text from, from this into EPUB? That's like the first and easiest question. It's how do we make a robust, deep and wide pedagogical experience out of something like this. We're making a beginnings of one of these now, an armchair app for McGraw-Hill, it's a, um, uh, an anatomy and physiology app, just to let you know how slow going this is. I first mentioned this app as being a potential thing we're doing two years ago when I spoke to this group. And so now it's about to be launched in spring. And it's an app, it's gruesome because you're dissecting cadavers, but, but it's kind of cool that way. But you, you look at naked dead people for a while. As you get kind of used to it. But it's an app that the general audience can groove on, but then it can also be used for med students. You could sit back and just cruise the topic deep and wide. And I see a lot more of this being what the textbook world should become. Not textbooks per se, but postbook artifacts, if you will, that can be used this way. And be used by who? That's the cool part about it. Who's the user group for these things? Everybody here. And that really blows up the whole concept of there being a textbook publisher. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. It's cool. And it can even be used, if it's modulated, it could be used by learners at different ages. And I see this thing, what we're looking at, iBook author making these interfaces, and having that be allowed for anyone to make it be the beginning of the postbook era, in a way. It goes well beyond that, hey, anyone can make textbooks now. It kind of freaks me out that they're just calling this a textbook thing. Because that's, that's not really the coolest part of it, it's that anyone can make a postbook now. Yeah? It's kind of cool. It's still, like I said, it's a little weak, it's more robust features, but that's the significance of this to me. And if you're an instructor and you have content from your school district and you have content, then you're personally ready right now to enter the postbook era and make these things for yourselves and distribute them up amongst yourselves. And then they may be even, well, you can distribute it globally. It's pretty amazing. So that's where I see us to be. We are in the postbook era, the very beginning. Those hopeful monsters are here and we've just been granted for free a program that allows us to enter this on our own terms. And if you're an educator, or a textbook publisher for that matter, but I think it's really exciting for educators, for content havers of their own, to start making their own postbooks and not wait for someone's business model to catch up. The postbook will wait for no one. <laughs> I should end on that note. <laughs> so well, thank you. Don't, don't go anywhere, you're going to sit down. Or in brilliant. And if we get Steve and Sandy coming up, <laughs> put, put on my tab. Uh, let them get set up. Uh, what we're going to do for the, I guess we have what, a half hour? Okay. Um, is I'll ask a couple of leading questions, softball questions, because I'm you know, a nice guy, moderator. I'm the Phil Donahue, so I'll be running around, raising your hand in a question. I'm here to help you ask, ask that question. And what I uh, wanted them to do was talk more about tonight. Uh, just what the experiences they have working with iBooks author, um, and also what's it like, what are all those problems that come up for as a consumer of the books and as a producer of the books? What are the things you have to be aware of uh, that you have to deal with there? So with that, I'm going to start, uh, maybe if, uh, Tim, if you want to tell Tim about your background experience with iBooks author, apps, etc. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Lauer, I'm a principal of Portland at Portland Elementary School. Um, and we've got a little, uh, about 85 iPads in the building in fourth and fifth grade, so it's basically like a few kids per machine, uh, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, but we've, uh, several of our teachers, uh, when we got the iPads, uh, were very interested in creating content uh, of their own. And, um, in particular, Ms. Jen, who teaches fifth grade, uh, for a number of years has been creating, uh, paper booklets, pamphlets, things on different units that she does. From the um, colonial America, whatever she's got all this stuff, and she's got all this content, as you were saying. Um, and so she started last year. Um, I pointed her to the uh, Apple has this thing about how you can use pages with like EPUBs, and, and I just like that. Um, and then I book author uh, came out, and um, that was more. She said, "That's what I want. I want something that's going to let me uh, create this." And then she got very excited about the. Quality, I guess, that you're talking about in terms of being able to dive in and um, add these 
increase in interactive elements and such. Um, but it was that type of thing. Um, but also, with several other features say, you know, not only for themselves in terms of creating content and then distributing content and sharing it with others, but also for students to use it as a, as a tool for creating their, their artifacts and their, their work and that kind of thing. So, um, we've been uh, adapting it since it came out, and um, we see a lot of possibilities. The um, one aspect that folks that I talk to and work with, uh, you know, it's an Apple product that works on iPads. Um, there are other things, and you have pictures of those other devices too. And uh, you know, in terms of being able to kind of share your content with a wider audience, I guess is one aspect of this. But also, you know, when when Apple announced this and they talked about it being this um, textbooks. And quite frankly, if you say textbooks to a lot of folks in education, your eyes roll over because it's, um, I, I like postbook, I like that a lot better. Um, thank you. <laughs> PM on the internet, of course. And, um, but all the open content, and all the content that's out there that is being shared, and, and folks are creating content with the sole purpose of sharing that content, and, um, and uh, kind of getting away from the publishing and industrial complex. So, what? Pearson? No. Um, but I see this as something that kind of levels that field and democratizes the process of, of putting out the content and putting the content and of rise or fall on what you think about it. It's clear enough. That's what we're playing. I have a question for Steve there. I, I know we've been thinking a lot about iBooks stuff, but you, know, you got iBooks, you got Kindle, you got EPUB, you got PDFs that are enhanced. I got HTML5 stuff. What's special about iBook author that sort of raises the bar? Is there something about it that's you know more special than these other publishing formats? What happened to me? Softballs. Sorry. Right. <laughs> 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 you check it I guess. Um, as, as just a bit of a background, I, I'm a former educator, and for about the past <coughs> 10 years, um, I've been working on the sort of education technology side of things, uh, for which the past three years or so, uh, I guess I've been one of those stegosaurs looking up at the comment coming down as I spend a lot of time with InDesign creating EPUBs or creating PDFs or exporting XHTML and using all those kind of fun acronyms speak when you're in a mixed company to make it sound like what you're doing is perhaps more technically complicated than it really is. Um, nevertheless, I'll, I mean that. We'll talk about XML before too long, or, or I'll die trying. Um, no, but it does make me feel better about myself. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, in terms of your question about what's special, I think it's because at this point, in, in terms of that timeline, as Corey was outlining for us, um, there's this tension in the publisher and I think in the creator world in terms of creating digital texts between, um, in, in essence, who has the most control over that presentation layer, right? So we're all familiar with the notion within an EPUB, for instance, that you open it up on whatever device or whatever application you're using, and if you're in bed, you switch it to night mode, and you increase the font size, and you adjust some of the lighting so whoever you're next to isn't offended by that. So you get a limited amount of control over the presentation layer, whilst in iBooks author, and, and, and certainly this applies as well, I think, for PDFs, you know, control is in the hands of the creator. If you want a fancy font, uh, something with really crazy serifs or whatever it is. Uh, you can see my pattern about UX is pretty limited. And I don't like serif humor, so I'm sorry about that. Um, serif jokes are always fun. Doing what I do. Um, you know, the control or the ability for something like iBooks Author to allow the content creator, publisher, whatever you want to call that person nowadays, is so much stronger, right? Because you can insert all of that media, it's so much easier to insert that media than it is using InDesign or pages like Tim was talking about. So I, I think the greatest strength of iBooks author 
is, of course, what I think is in, to obviously for anyone who's maybe downloaded, I think E.O. Wilson, that you know, the, the uh, textbook was kind of his sample one was kind of the most most popular download for quite a while for my book's author. You can see all of that incredible control and design or UX design that went into that. So I think that's a great strength, but it doesn't resolve that tension between what an ebook allows, which is a very small, packageable chunk of content, or comparatively small amount of content, that the user can manage or exert some control over, versus looking at something that feels very different than that. It feels like the experience that the designer wanted you to have. It's almost the difference between ebook and postbook. Yes. of this thing allows us to really treat the unique content scenario, content strategy of this kinds of stuff, educational content, non-fiction content in general, to really give it its due. I think it's a, in that in that model or those steps you were talking about <coughs> before a little bit earlier, I think one of the issues when you start to kind of look at that archaeology of where we're at with iBooks is that when people talk about interactive, to me it feels very much like for those of you who were maybe working in the Flash world five or six years ago, to call something interactive just meant you know a head spun or you could mouse over something and it was some little action took place or maybe like when the picture blows up there. Right? And so the level of interactivity that's allowable or creatable by iBooks author I think is still a little bit limited. You know, the, the quiz functionality, the sort of assessments, they still feel, to me anyway, in my education background, quite dated in a fairly, you know, growth way to engage with, to engage with the reader or with the student. I know there are some features, certainly I've been spending perhaps more time than I should be with, you know, the HTML widget feature within iBooks author and what you can get into that. Exactly, it's not easy. It's like trying to shoot more JavaScript into the email, which I've also spent too much time and that's all to try to get what I think is a more robust or a richer interactive experience. It's a big Exactly. There's no shared adaptation. There's a question. I was going to say just one thing before the question. Um, the, the social aspects that you talked about in the post presentation there, I think, are really, really powerful in terms of uh, interaction between the student and the teacher and that type of thing, or the author and the reader. And um, one of the things I'm a little disappointed this tool, um, and it's an iBooks issue, I guess, in terms of, um, there are various other tools I use on the iPad in terms of annotating uh, text and PDFs. I annotate is one example. And uh, last year I was taking a grad course and I had a lot of reading I had to do and, I, and they were all PDFs, and so I dumped them into I annotate. And you can highlight and you could add notes and such, and at the end of that, at any point in that process, I could click a couple buttons and basically I am the email me all of my highlights, all of my notes, all you know, I've got my outlines ready to go. And I books the moment grab the content, the moment grab, grab my highlights. And I'm sure that's a licensing type of thing, I would imagine. Um, but that that kind of functionality, and then the social aspect of, of I as a teacher, um, some place for, for students to provide me feedback in terms of they've read uh, or questions and that kind of thing. I'm sure all that stuff's coming. But that's, that's the kind of stuff I like to see. It's a bummer to have to wait. Corey, you, you talked about, and I think I got this right, post both separating the content from the delivery method. And that's being a feature of the post book. But it seems to me that iBooks author marries that more than anything else has in the past. It's not just that it only works on iOS, it only works on one device on iOS, it doesn't work on my iPhone. Right? So, how is that an example of? the post book and is it something that should be part of the post book thought if it's really going backwards in the sense of if even if it's a dominant platform, it's still tied to one platform. Yeah, that's a good that's a good sign of question as a topic. But um, I would say what, what I wasn't saying is that a post book is when you have the content differentiated from the container. 
Rather, that's just been the state of affairs since the web, basically since Marco, so that we can actually have this possibility. I mean, that's allowed postbooks to occur. And so when you're creating this postbook app, let's say, when you are getting content and sticking it into a container, <clears throat> and it's kind of stuck there, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That makes an effective experience, and that's fine. Um, but there is something annoying about that it's only going to work on, on iPads, for example. But that's annoying now because we're in the local monster stage. And so I'm going to advocate everyone make, let's make thousands of different types of armchair apps. Let's make all these different postbooks. Let's make ones for Zona. What are the different platforms now? The Zuni Woody and the iPad and the App and Amber. Make them for all of them. You tell what kind of iOS specific. The Galaxy Tab. <laughs> so you can make it for all those things, and let's just see where this lands. But that is, that is, that's another thing that speaks to me about live book off. You know, it's proprietary, um, and stuck on the device, but I'm not letting any of these things stop us. Let's just keep going and make local monsters and see what's So, so could we talk a little bit more about the proprietary part about iBooks? That there is this element of uh, the distribution, the EULA agreement. Apple did revise it to make it clearer that they don't want to fully own your stuff on other platforms, but what sort of constraints or issues might that create in the education space for schools that want to get, you know, purchase either iBooks, which is a whole other sort of series of questions about really will schools do textbook adoption, but but what about just publishing and, and being able to sell your books and such? What what constraints is that creating artificially? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think about that stuff that much. I'm really focusing on designing and making these things. Obviously, it's going to create all these business logic issues that are going to need to be worked through. And other stuff can be really scary sometimes. So, it's something I need to, to focus on. Do you have issues with your instructors that are doing these things? No, to, no, to no I mean, basically, um, they're, say, I mean, they're nothing they're selling their content on, on the store, on iTunes or whatever, the bookstore, whatever it's called. Um, they're basically, you know, in the, the tool, you can export the um, their repo, and then you can put it someplace and kids can go grab it. And the uh, book and, and the iPad. So, so that hasn't been um, concerned, but a you know, not <coughs> commercial approach. But, hey, Tim, do you see that as a predominant way that teachers would use that? <coughs> that they would bypass the commercial side of it entirely and just self publish, take OER, open education resources? Hey, I think you probably you have a lot of teachers out there, you know, nationally, internationally, who are good stuff. And that'll probably, you know, their model might be the <coughs> to be a college industry program. Um, you know, might have my fifth grade teacher basically just wants the kids to get the content, and she's just putting it up on a link, and the kids are clicking it and it downloads. So. Okay, question over here. So. Um, a couple of things about me. Um, I mean, I'm one of the dreaded adjunct instructors at Oral in higher education. Um, I'm also uh, a committed Apple user uh, across all platforms, um, phone, iPad, and, and laptop. Um, and, and I really um, kind of struggle with what was doing and what what they proposed here, um, because um, I don't have the power, and I don't um, and I don't want the power to tell my students what platform they should be using, um, and and I'm also rather skeptical. You could go to a higher level than me. You could go to a departmental level or maybe even an institutional level, but I'm kind of skeptical that departments and institutions really want to be in that game either. You know, perhaps a you know primary school, public school kind of situation, but in in higher education, you know, I have students that are committed to Android and, and other kind of platforms, Windows and other kind of platforms in, in their own personal use. And, and I want to respect that. So I, another you know, observation about myself is that I'm horribly dissatisfied with the offerings of all of the textbook publishers, both in print and, on, and in digital formats. Um, and so I really want great textbook content that I can assign and that 
um, I can let the um, students, the users, um, figure out how they're going to access it, what they're going to do with it. Um, and I don't see a way to get there, get there from here in the conversation that we're having right now, and perhaps some of y'all have some ideas about that. Thank you. I guess one thing that occurs to me, or occurred to me while you were making your remarks, is thinking about, and, and Tim, you, you might be able to speak to this as well, is that notion of textbook as mashup. I think that's lost quite a bit of luster over the past few years, but uh, if you think two, three years ago, uh, O'Reilly was offering the ability, and I think still does, it's just I think, pretty underused for um, instructors to be able their own little textbook. What's in that case they did something like this before? Um, yeah, I mean, that, uh, in terms of uh, just being able to be able to do that, like you're, you have your course that you're offering, you know, like chapter seven from this book, <coughs> chapter eight from this book, and, and then this article from such and such journal, and you know, I mean, we're all in college, and you have your, you have your packets that you go get from those or whatever, it's like, Day. Um, but, uh, you know, and the same still when I went to the grad course last year, and like all of the files and things that were that was online and pulled it off. Um, but I think it's a real good question, though, in terms of, um, and especially, um, you know, the various devices and such, is how are you, you going to, if you're a teacher, you want to reach all of your students, and all, not all of my kids are going to have like that. They're going to have other devices. And, they're going to have laptops. And, and so what I would love to see is, um, but again, you, it, it, you get it, you, there's this trade-off because you have this wonderful functionality like, like in the, the Wilson book and such, where you can create this beautiful thing um, and have this immersive experience, but you are tied to one platform when you do that. Um, you can always print the PDF right? uh, out of, you can export that out of uh, the tool. And, um, but again, you lose all of the other qualities that so um, I don't have an answer, but I, it, it's a problem. I mean, I, you get a lot of kids who want to be able to deliver this content to them. If you're tying it to one device, you're going to have some trouble. Corey, in your work with the publishers and such, after the announcement of the iBook author on January 28th, on the morning 29th, how many voicemails did you have from the publishers asking, oh my god, what am I going to do? What does this mean? Do we have to change our strategy? Do we just not more? None, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 not that day, so. I was setting you up for yeah, it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, I was like, when you make it count, everything. I was excited. Uh, they had, my, my clients, you know, they, they launched with it. They had textbooks out, but it wasn't, it wasn't higher ed. It was on K-12. My, my clients were the higher ed people, so they weren't all that interested. And is higher ed just ignoring the whole iBook? Yeah, <laughs> I really don't know too much about it, because they, they you know, I don't think they know too much about it. Um, but I know that they're doing a lot of work with England, and that's their, that's the bed they're in right now. So I don't know if they could do as much as they're doing with England and investing as much as they are in that platform, and also go build the iBook around. So I'm not sure. Um, that, that being said, I did get a lot of calls that week, not from the publishers, though, but from other clients who were doing things for it, um, who had all kinds of content that <coughs> actually we would have geared up to make an app for them, which would have been a really specific app with their content, pictures, etc. And it would have caused a lot more, you know, they thought, so why don't we just do an iBook? Yeah, why don't we actually? So we're doing some of those now, which is kind of satisfying. We have a much quicker development cycle and make something really delightful and make it rapid. So it's allowed us to make these other kind of app-like things, not textbooks. When you're in K-12, usually the books are bought for you. As you get to college with, you know, you have the ubiquitous I can't, can't hear you. When you get into college with ubiquitous e-books, that's also about the time you start buying books personally. So do you think the expectation will change in the long term for all forms of books because of the change in college uh, and the logical sense of Fox, speaker. Uh, just <laughs> My thoughts are on that. Uh, Steve, I got a quick question for you and get another audience question. Uh, what sort of production challenges are there? I mean, if you're a publisher, if you're self-publishing, you got 
if you're a teacher, you've got your own content, you can publish a book, maybe you've got a couple of books in mind you can do, maybe less than a dozen titles to say. But if you're a publisher and you've got a series you want to do, if you're a you know, world book or something, how practical is the iBooks platform for that? Or is it really still meant for individual consumer or just publishing your own stuff versus an institutional publisher? Right. Well, I, I guess I would think there would be kind of two questions I'd want to start with um, to try to address that, or two issues I'd want to go over. One is the extent of either existing sort of interactives, whether that, or even just media that that publisher already has developed or has the budget to go ahead and develop it all along with it. So first it's to, to sort of determine if they have the content or are planning to create the content that necessitates that kind of experience. So that kind of be issue number one. And then secondly, in a way it gets to the gentleman's question up here talking about platform and accessibility. Um, you know, one uh, solution we haven't talked about, or I certainly haven't mentioned, would be Adobe's digital publishing suite. Right? And this is what allows all of the, you know, the magazines, I think Martha Stewart's is kind of the most famous exemplar of that. And of course, as you look at it, it has um, most of the same sorts of interactive features that iBooks authors. It does lack some of the, uh, of course, more education-focused kind of pieces, the sort of off-the-shelf widgets to the magazines or the note card features and functionality. But if you're looking at the kind of ability to push out content, by virtue of being able to use a solution like Adobe's system, which has, you know, obviously some pluses and minuses, the biggest one being, well, the biggest two being it costs more than iBooks author. And uh, as anyone who's used any Adobe product in the past 10 years knows, the learning curve is quite a bit steeper in terms of all those damn panels. You have to open and close and switch and toggle. But if you can overcome or address those two issues, um, you know, it's hard to say which is the best route to go right now. But there's cert it certainly um, would be a tough decision, I think, to make because the digital publishing suite really does offer that ability to any publisher to reach across multiple devices, um, be it mobile devices or desktop devices. As well. That audience question. If you got other questions, raise your hand so I can see them. Okay, I'll make it around. Just, just kind of following up on all that. Um, I, I'm on the publishing side, uh, in, and uh, you know, your textbooks are sort of experimental right now. I'm curious about how the, the business aspects are going to play out for textbooks um, on two, two areas. Um, one is, um, you know, for, for many publishers, you have to have parity. So, you know, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iBooks all insist that you know, you're releasing the same products at a very close time frame and similar products. And, you know, even, even there have been cases, you know, where say Barnes & Noble might pull print books off the shelves because Amazon had an exclusive deal with digital. Um, you know, so that kind of thing, I think, you know, I'm curious what textbooks are going to run into. And then the other is uh, just on the pricing models in the same area where, you know, somebody like Amazon might discount incredibly, you know, you have to work out whether you're in a, um, you know, a, a wholesale sales business or, um, uh, you know, where you can control your own pricing through agency models. So, anyway. <laughs> well, I guess one thing I'll start with sort of my thoughts are um, a lot having to do with textbook sales, at least at the K 12 level, really have nothing to do with what we might all think of as the normal ways that you go about purchasing books, right? It has to do with adoption cycles, and that means it has to go through uh, typically school boards and the state and parents. Maybe even in some remarkable cases, the students themselves actually get to see the books before they're purchased by their district. So that whole tension of how iBooks author or, or digital textbooks, whatever term you want to use, how school districts begin to address that, you know, I think is, is in my mind really an open issue. And I think much of the market is looking at you know the, the vanguards of that area, which would be states. California, Texas, and Florida. Uh, and I think at this point, most of them are really making decisions based on obvious cost models, which is they start to look at all the sort of factors that you get in 
not only our traditional textbooks, I think as everyone knows, really expensive, 50, 60, 80 bucks a whack that districts have to buy in huge numbers. Um, but then, you know, they have devices and they get some sort of special deal, which all kinds of the digital device makers are starting to offer in limited ways. But, you know, that's at just as terrible an inflection point in a way as the whole publishing model is to try to figure that out because, of course, all of that is uh, underpinned by the fact that there's going to be partly a flush district in terms of money out there and they're looking to cut costs and money anywhere they can. These, these questions that about the business model just bring up how uh, there's all these hopeful monsters there too. We're in that disrupted moment and there's really no clear way forward. So as long as we keep trying and try to work this out and make it happen, we'll see how it shakes out. That, that's what I like when you're talking, that's what I hear. Is that you just need to see how it shakes out. Um, there's so many factors and it's so complex from such a disruptive moment. And what, what I'm interested in is making sure that that doesn't stop anyone from talking. That we just keep throwing this against the wall and see what happens. The textbook market is already very interestingly arranged in that they're selling books not to the users, not to the students, but to the instructors of the district to buy on behalf of the it's already kind of odd, but it's worked out its own parameters over the years. And another thing to remember that's coming up in these questions is that we're still also at that sort of nascent moment, the very beginning of this, where the kinds of things I'm advocating, even the iBooks, can't be course critical yet. And that's one of the things that's slowing my clients down, the textbook publishers. They're not going to start investing too much in this because it can't be course critical. We don't have one-to-one -one for devices, even in college. I mean, certainly as the adjunct instructor was saying, you can't expect that of your students. If you don't want to start telling them, you can't take this class unless you have an iPhone. So we're just not, we're just not there yet. When we're going to be there, I don't know. But we're in this, that's not discouraging, that's encouraging for me. We're, this, we're in this exciting Big Bang moment. And that's a cool place to be. There'll be that end of the rainbow. There'll be that end of that line over there. That's what I could say. There's that end of the line, we'll see what happens. We'll look back and go, like, it was so confusing. But now, it's so confusing, and that's exciting. <laughs> uh, one thing that, that took, as Corey, I think you touched on, is that there are limitations in, in iBook Author that you wouldn't have in an app if you were just coding it from scratch. Yes. But one thing that seems a little weird to me is that if uh, the textbooks cost 60 or 80 bucks, they last for three or four years, the district they get drawn and thrown away. I've never bought an app that costs more than $10. I've certainly never bought an 80 dollar app. So it seems like apps are cheap and textbooks are expensive. But with but the capabilities in an app are much, much greater. So I don't know if there are any examples out there. I have I haven't looked for them, but I, are there any in education where someone said, here, I built an app. It's not a textbook, it's an app, but it's worth 100 bucks, or it's worth 50 bucks for social bucks. Yeah, the, uh, because then you can do these social interactions with these Well, in, 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 the, the inkling textbooks are pretty expensive. Um, they're less expensive than books, but I think like $110. I'm making this up, so if my clients are watching the program, sorry. Um, but I think like a $110 chemistry book, they click version to 80 bucks. What is it an app or What's that? You can buy it by the chapter, that's true. You get all your buddies to go buy the chapter. And yeah, there's ways around this. But yeah, there's, and it, that, that almost has more to do with business model and do that. And but those are the books are sold to the app store, not through the yeah. 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 That's interesting. Question over here. I guess in a way, the, um, the models that we're talking about imply a radical change. Uh, you know, two of the extremes of radical change right now that relate to the idea of curating and content are probably at one extreme, the Salman Khan, you know, one guy creates courses for what, all kinds of grade levels, all kinds of content. And it's really good, and everybody uses it. They always use it as a grease board and a pen, or a grease pen. Uh, there's no app or no, nothing else that goes with it. There's no publisher, but he's developed a very strong brand, and he's curating his content. The other extreme would be something like Moodle, uh, which, in, a, in my perception at least, is let everyone create content, uh, but none of it's used very widely. But the people are very enthusiastic about it, that use it. So what, what do we learn from um, those kind of extremes about curating content and where publishers might be in the future if they even exist? Yeah. The con stuff is really interesting because, um, I mean, you can take a tool like this author and um, a little 
class of widget, widget book that you can read YouTube, you know, within your book. So if I'm a fifth grade math teacher and I have written um, some content that is you know, about multiplication or something, and um, but then I, I can also take that piece of content that he's created and embed that in, in this thing that I had, and I, um, I can go a little bit deeper with my kids. I know what they need. Maybe I don't. I can explain it in a different way, but also this illustrates that too. When you start to, I guess, the Steve was talking about the mashup where you're pulling the content together, um, that's really exciting to me as an educator to be able to, because there's all this good stuff out there, and a lot of it is, um, um, you know, in, in, you know, you know, not that that is going to allow you completely to use it, but it's open in one manner or another, great comments or whatever, uh, and that to me is real exciting. I mean, I was about the content day, being able to embed YouTube videos. There's all kinds of good content there. There's all kinds of crap too. There's all kinds of great content. Um, and for the most part, they put it up there, allow you to use it, and you can pull it into your um, help illustrate a point for a student. You pull these different elements together. That's pretty exciting. So, Tim, do you imagine that teachers will basically make the well, over here? Uh, do you do you imagine that teachers will basically make uh, almost like workbooks for students, where they might assemble a Patchwork of videos or pieces, maybe some con content, some right. of their own I mean, stuff. And yeah, Miss uh, Miss Miss Jen, who's one well, of my fifth grade teachers, has this book on invertebrates that she's created, and you know, basically she's pulling content off of YouTube and different things, uh, images and such. You know, we had a good conversation about you know, fair use, and we had a good conversation about uh, you know what's what you can or cannot use. Because, uh, but, but the thing is. You know, if you want to do that, you could easily do that now. And it wasn't easy to do that before. And um, my question and comment is along the same lines. Um, I'm a librarian, academic librarian, and in, uh, at my university, I, I guess I'm beginning to think that um, it sounds to me a little bit like the iBooks author is maybe geared towards K-12 a little more, I'm not sure. I did look at the, the free book, I have one on my iPad and I think it's beautiful and it reminded me of a Push Pop Press, our choice, an awful lot. And I was pretty impressed with that the first time I saw it. But along the same lines as the last two commenters at our, at our university, myself and our hybrid learning director, have been leading workshops with faculty to teach them how to create books for their courses. And they're able, with a very simple tool, and we, we look purposely for the simplest way that they could grab content from not only just open source articles and so forth, but YouTube videos to embed within those books, audio files, images, and their own writing, as well as scholarly peer review journals from the subscription databases that the library subscribes to, as long as that book is kept within the Moodle learning management system we're able to actually add that content, which is very valuable content uh, as well. So they're, they're actually, and, and these are not techie faculty that we're training. These are, this is actually a fairly simple process now. Maybe we do an hour workshop, and a couple folks are on their way right with that, and then some have asked us back to do a second one, help them tweak things. But it's really a fairly simple, so I am wondering about this concept of, you know, faculty creating and curating, you know, content and creating these books. They're not nearly as beautiful and interactive as the iBook author books, but those books, again, seem to be, I mean, very geared K-12. I mean, I would have loved those books, you know, as a student, but in higher ed, it's, it's kind of different, and I think the faculty are enjoying having their own say as well. I'm just wondering, again, like others, where this is going and where it might end up. The other thing is, our books have to work on all platforms, and the tool that we're using is actually created also in experts in, uh, for uh, I, uh, EPUB, Nooks, um, Android, as well as on the web itself. So for students who have no mobile device, they can still read that book. So that's a, a we can't go with anything other than that. I don't think we're unique in that. What, what, what the, is that a term the bell's product? No, the tool is called EPUB Bud. EPUB Bug. EPUB Bug. It's a web-based tool. It's not a download, it's just on the web. It's, 
I don't know, it almost seems too good to be true, and we've questioned that. It's a non-profit, it doesn't cost it, we just don't quite get why. You must now keep up up to <laughs> Come to me for all your needs. I really laud what you're doing. It's really an exciting story. It drives home what makes the whole kind of close book thing I'm talking about possible. Is that you're going to wear, maybe not all, but let's just say this way to be dramatic, we're all content providers, right? And certainly Twitter's relying on that. But we are all content providers in a way. We can all create these curated collections of interactive content of our own stuff. And especially if you're in an educational context, you can do that with tools like this deep love love you're talking about. Or this iBook author and all the EPUB bug, iBook author, those are all just these are all just the hopeful, hopeful monsters. These are all the accidents along the way. Eventually something will come around that is cross-platform, if there are multiple platforms, or that's usable, but just seeing the impulse, seeing it happen, seeing you doing it spontaneously, just finding a tool that makes it work, lets me know it's gonna be alright and that we're gonna we're gonna break through into the other side. I think we're almost out of time. Uh, the last question comes from via Twitter from uh, Jason Griggs. Uh, couldn't be here tonight. He wanted to ask Corey, what was the first mobile device? Jason, the first mobile device. The first mobile tools were stone tools. That's what you want to do. I was hoping it's a very elaborate story. Well, there is. We're almost done. You want to see it? Wax about stone tools, but the, the earliest tools, <laughs> the things that made humans humans, were these hand axes. We started using these hand axes to replace our teeth, and it was mobile technology that made humans what they are. They could walk around with these stone tools, allow them to walk around places they didn't walk around before. So it's mobile technology that makes us human. Great. Right, Riggs? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Look forward to seeing you again.